Okay, so when we're talking about alternators and reviewing alternators here, uh, we're going to start off with uh, the alternator itself and talk about the various different components inside of it. We'll move on from there and talk about how we test those components and uh, how the alternator functions as a whole. And then we'll finish off with talking about uh, testing alternator function in the vehicle. <clears throat> so starting off, uh, alternators generally have a uh, very similar construction. You've got your uh, frames, your uh, drive-in frame and then the rear frame. You've got your main or uh, major components inside there, the rotor, the stator, and your uh, diodes. Your diodes are uh, going to be part of your rectifier, possibly part of a diode trio if it's got that, and you may or may not have an internally mounted regulator. The way that an alternator works is we generate alternating current, hence the term alternator, and we generate that alternating current by rotating a magnetic field inside of the stator windings. Uh, as that rotating magnetic field moves past the windings, it induces current flow in the windings. We're going to skip past a few of these slides. This is all available on Moodle. Uh, if you're following along in the course there, uh, this is the starting and charging systems review uh, download. So the rotor itself, that's the part that spins inside the alternator. <coughs> that is our rotating magnetic field. Uh, in most cases, your rotor is going to have uh, slip rings and the field coil mounted integral to the rotor. Uh, the regulator's job is to control the field current, which controls the strength of the magnetic field of the rotor. The slip rings connect ground and um, the regulated current flow um, from the regulator uh, up to the uh, field winding. And then as it spins around, that magnetic field interacts with the stator windings to induce current flow in them. The current flow coming out of the stator windings is alternating current. We use a rectifier bridge to turn that alternating current into direct current. The alternators that we use are generally three phase. So that gives us three phases or three separate windings in the stator. Uh, those three phases, when we rectify them, it does give us a fairly smooth DC output. The DC output from the stator uh, might be generated by a delta or a Y wound. And either way, whether it's a delta or a Y wound, that three phase is fed to a at least a six diode rectifier bridge. And that takes the output from all of the windings, rectifies it to DC, and outputs a steady DC current. The difference between Y wound and delta wound is the way that the ends of the stator windings are terminated. With a Y wound stator, uh, we terminate all three together in the center, and then we pull each one of our phases from A, B, and C. <clears throat> For a delta wound, we terminate the ends of all of the stator windings together uh, so that we basically have a parallel arrangement. A delta and a Y wound. A delta is typically more suited to higher current. A Y wound is typically suited to higher voltage output. Here we can see how we've got uh, a set of positive and a set of negative diodes as part of the rectifier. That connects the output of the stator to the ground or the negative and the positive side of the electrical system in the piece of equipment. In order to energize the field, we control the field with the regulator. And you may hear about A and B type uh, field control. Really all that means is whether we're controlling the field on the positive or the negative side after or before the coil. So here with the B type, we're controlling the field current before the field, and then we just ground the other side of the field. <clears throat> with an A type, we supply battery voltage to the field, and then we turn on and off the ground with the regulator. As far as operation of the alternator goes internally, 
this diagram right here is showing us a very simple alternator with an internal regulator. It includes the rectifier, the diode trio, the regulator, your stator, and your field. On an alternator like this, the battery power is connected to, or the battery itself is connected to the alternator's uh, battery terminal over here. So you can see that the, the alternator and the battery are always connected to one another. Um, and as long as there's alternator output, it's gonna be pushing current back into the battery to recharge the battery. It's also pushing current out to the vehicle's electrical system to run the accessories on the vehicle. If you want the alternator to charge, we need to turn the alternator on. <clears throat> Your ignition switch is gonna close and positive battery power, uh, in this case here, is going through an indicator lamp. The indicator lamp sends power into the alternator. It's gonna follow this path down to the field. Now, when we've just got the key on and the vehicle's not running yet, there is going to be a small amount of power going through the field. And when it goes through the field, it comes up to a transistor. That TR1 is the transistor that we're talking about. In order for the alternator to charge, that transistor has to be on and supplying ground to the ground side of the field. So in this case here, we can see that this alternator um, is controlling the ground side of the field to regulate output. As the field starts to spin because the engine's running, it starts to induce current flow in the stator windings. That current flow in the stator windings is fed to the rectifier bridge. The rectifier bridge is going to turn that output into DC power and start to charge the battery and run the vehicle electrical system. Another place that the output from the um, the stator goes is to a device called the diode trio. The diode trio rectifies, and, and the diode trio is not full wave rectification, it's only half wave rectification, but that doesn't matter. Its job is to supply field current to the alternator. So the alternator basically powers itself when it's charging. So we collect that output and we send it into the same spot that we were feeding power from the indicator lamp and the key switch. We end up with, let's call this 12 volts, and we had 12 volts coming in through the key switch. When the alternator starts to charge and the stator output start, uh, starts to feed through the diode trio, we end up with 12 volts now taking over and feeding the field coil from the output of the stator itself. And as the alternator is now running and powering itself, the 12 volts that we were feeding from the diode trio and the 12 volts that we were feeding from the key switch means that we've got 12 volts on both sides of the indicator lamp. That shuts the indicator lamp off. If you get the same voltage on both sides of the lamp, you've effectively got no current flow, the lamp shuts off. If for some reason the alternator stops charging, now we don't have 12 volts feeding and now that char the charge indicator light turns back on and the operator knows there's a fault with the alternator. So with this alternator here, in order to regulate the field current, we have to know what the charging voltage is in the system. The charging voltage in the system, and I'm gonna go ahead and get rid of all of the stuff that I've got here right now. So the charging voltage in the system can be sensed internally or externally. If it's sensed internally, all we're gonna do is just take a look at what the output of the alternator is and regulate it based on that. If it's sensed externally, we're going to run a sense wire from the battery back to the alternator. <clears throat> this example right here is showing us an external sense wire. The sense wire coming back from the battery goes to the uh, internal regulator in the alternator. And if the voltage 
coming back from the battery is sufficient to break down this zener diode right here, then it applies a base current to transistor number two. That's this transistor right here. When we apply base current to this transistor, what we do is we effectively shut off transistor number one. Okay. By shutting off transistor number one, we shut off the ground. And if you shut off the ground, the alternator output goes down. If the alternator output goes down and your battery voltage, your system voltage goes down, now the voltage that comes up to the Zener diode over here is gonna start falling and the Zener diode is gonna turn off again. When it turns off, this transistor here stops killing the base current for transistor number one um, by effectively shutting off transistor number three. And now we have a ground path once again for the field. So this is the basic function of an internal regulator type alternator. Uh, feel free to watch that portion of the video a few times if you need to get a little bit of a better handle on what's going on there. Let's talk a little bit about um, problems that can happen uh, with reference to the diagram here. So low charge output. Okay, so low current output, low charge output from the alternator. So if you have low output from the alternator, sometimes the reason for that is you lose diodes in your diode trio. And that means that we don't have sufficient current and voltage to power the field anymore. When that happens, your field isn't supplying a strong enough magnetic field to the stator, and the alternator output goes down. If you end up losing one or more of your diode trio diodes, the voltage coming out of there is low. And that means that your light, your charge light may start to glow. Because now instead of having 12 on both sides, we still have 12 on this side, but maybe we only have, you know, eight volts on the other side because we're missing one of our phases. Another thing that can happen is you may lose connection because you've got worn brushes inside your alternator. It's an older alternator, a lot of hours on it. So now we don't have a complete circuit through the field. If that happens, again, your alternator is not going to charge. Some alternators are self-energizing. And what that means is this section of the circuit here does not exist. Okay, so if you have low or no charge, and you have a self-energizing alternator, <clears throat> what might end up, end up happening is your field rotor is made out of iron. And when you energize the coil, that magnetizes the iron and it turns it into an electromagnet. When you shut the field current off, the magnetism goes away. But what'll happen with a self-energizing alternator is we're relying on there being a little bit of residual magnetism in the rotor itself. It's quite similar to what happens when you take a magnetizer and you magnetize your screwdriver. You use it to hold a screw so you can install it in a tight spot without dropping it. But if you take that same screwdriver and you use it a little while later, it's still slightly magnetic on the end. But if you leave it sitting in your toolbox for you know a week or two and come back to it, it may not be magnetic anymore. It'll have lost its magnetism over time. Back to alternators. If you've got a self-energizing alternator that's been sitting for a long time, what can happen is the residual magnetism in the rotor dissipates. And now, instead of having a little bit of magnetism that was able to uh, put just a little bit of current flow into the stator, which again would have put a little bit of voltage into the diode trio, which would have been just enough to kickstart the charging process. It's just not there anymore. So now you've got an alternator where there's physically nothing wrong with it, but it just doesn't charge. All right. Now, sometimes that happens. And if it happens, uh, maybe an inexperienced tech would just take that alternator off, throw it in the box and put a new one on. But if you understand what type of alternator you're dealing with, then what you can do 
is you can go ahead and try and see if you can excite that alternator to turn it back on. When you're exciting an alternator, what does that mean? Well, on a uh, self-energizing alternator, typically you've only got a battery wire going to it. And you'll probably notice as well on an alternator like that, somewhere on the alternator frame, there's a little, it looks kind of like a stud sticking up, but there's no threads on it. And quite often there's a little rubber cover over top of that stud. That is the stud, that is the connection that you use to excite the alternator to reestablish that residual magnetism in the field so it can start charging again. If that's the case, there's going to be a wire or a connection inside the alternator that hooks up to your positive brush lead. And what you do to excite the alternator is you take that rubber cover off of there and you momentarily hook a wire up to battery and you just jump it momentarily, basically just jump it enough to make a start, uh, a spark, and the alternator should turn back on because now you've turned this thing back into a magnet. Okay, so important things to remember, residual magnetism on self-energizing alternators, that's how they start to charge. And that's why on some pieces of equipment, you do have to rev the engine up to get the alternator to turn on because you got to get that field moving fast enough past the stator to induce some current flow through your diode trio so the field can turn on and start working properly. When you've got an alternator and the alternator's got a problem with its rectifier, those are these six diodes right here. What'll end up happening is we get uh, rectification when the diodes are doing what they're supposed to do. And rectification means instead of getting alternating current out of the alternator, we get direct current out of the alternator. And that direct current, we need that for things to work as they're supposed to. And what that direct current is, it's really just us taking this portion and calling it effectively 12 volts, okay? So the rectifier is there to basically chop off and redirect all of the alternating current so that it's all happening up at the top here, okay? And if that alternating current is all happening up at the top, you can see how all of these waves, they really start to overlap one another. And there's very little, there's very little humps left above the line. Okay. But if we end up in a situation where we lose one of the phases because one of our diodes isn't doing what it's supposed to be doing, then that means that we end up with this big gap here. And that gap, that's going to be uh, basically blips along that line of solid DC that we wanted. So it's gonna be doing this. Instead of getting a nice smooth 12 volts DC, we get these dips. Those dips can cause electrical interference with your machine. They can cause low charging current. They can wreak havoc with your electrical system. If that's a problem, it's fairly easy to diagnose. You take a multimeter, and you hook your multimeter up across your battery and you set your multimeter to AC. If the rectifier is working properly, there should be very little AC. If your rectifier is not working properly, there's going to be more AC voltage present. Okay, You should have less than 0.5 volts AC if your rectifier is doing its job. If you have more than that, that means you've probably lost a phase because you have a bad diode in your diode trio. When we're talking about alternators and uh, charging and testing alternators, uh, a lot of times it's easy to assume that all you need to do is check the charging voltage. And if the charging voltage is sufficient, that means that your alternator is charging there's a more accurate way to test an alternator and that's load testing it. When you're load testing an alternator, you need three tools. You need a voltmeter, 
you need an ammeter. And you're going to need some means of creating load on the alternator. Best tool, carbon pile. So what you want to do is take your carbon pile and hook it up across the battery. Okay, and your carbon pile is a big variable resistor. We're going to use that to apply load to the system. <clears throat> we're also going to monitor voltage. And when we're monitoring voltage, we're talking about system voltage. The other thing that we're going to do is we're going to put our amp clamp around the battery wire coming out of the alternator. We're going to monitor charging current there. So with the engine running, and we're not going to do this at low idle, we'll rev it up to operating RPM. And we'll start applying a load with the carbon pile and we're going to monitor our voltage and we're going to see two things happen. If we were to look at a graph of what was happening while we did this test, it would look something like this. Okay, Your voltage would remain fairly high as we apply the load. And then as we apply the load, sooner or later your voltage is going to start falling off. As we apply a load, our charging current is going to go up Okay, and our charging current is going to plateau once the alternator has reached its maximum output. So to figure out what the alternator can put out, we got to apply load to the electrical system. While we're applying load, we monitor current, and we're going to watch that current, and we're going to see it come up, peak, and uh, it'll just kind of plateau there. It'll hold. So if I have a 170 amp alternator, I'd like to see that amperage come up, hit 170 amps. The whole time I'm doing that, I'm really hoping that my voltage doesn't fall on its face. Because if my voltage starts to go down, that means now I'm past the point of where the alternator is supplying current to the load. And now I'm starting to draw current from the battery. And the alternator can't maintain charging voltage anymore. So the way I know that I've maxed out the alternator is the current has come up and plateaued and the voltage just starts to fall, maybe a volt or so. And at that point, I can tell what the alternator output is. As long as my alternator output meets specs, we're golden. If the alternator output is below spec, then you do have a case for um, replacing the alternator or maybe taking it apart and testing some of the internal components to figure out what's wrong and repairing it. In today's world, um, it's basically confirmed that the alternator is faulty and swap it out for replacement. When it comes to actually testing internal components of the alternator, uh, nine times out of 10 nowadays, we don't even take them apart. So this isn't something you'd have to concern yourself with. Uh, but when it comes to testing, there is a few things you can do and a few things you can't do. Now, you can check and see how much resistance you have on your field to see if the field is okay. You could check and see on a Y wound stator if you had opens, if any of those coils were open. You can check and see on a delta wound stator, which is this guy right here, if you have any continuity to ground. You can do the same on a Y wound stator. You can't really check for opens on a delta wound stator though, because everything is parallel. If you're checking for opens, and let's say this guy right here was the open, you still have another path around the stator. So you can't just use an ohmmeter to check for opens. You have to use a stator tester that um, puts current through the stator and measure how much current goes through and make sure it's the same amount of current that can go through based on the internal resistance of those coils to see if your stator is in fact good, if it's shorted, or if it's open. When it comes to testing other components, you need specialized test equipment that most people probably don't have access to. Um, a stator tester, or uh, sorry, a regulator tester, that'd be one of those things. Uh, but your multimeter, you can use that to check the diodes. All right, you could test the diodes. And when you're testing a diode in forward bias, that basically means you've got your multimeter hooked up in the diode test function. So there should be current flow 
through the diode, your multimeter is going to apply voltage to that diode, and it's going to give you back a number in volts that tells you what the voltage drop across the diode is. Effectively, how much voltage does it take to get that diode to turn on? If you hook it up in the correct polarity, you're going to end up with a number that probably is somewhere a little above or a little below a half a volt for a working diode. If you re, uh, remove your leads and hook them up the other way in reverse bias, the diode should block. A diode is like an electrical check valve. It should block the current flow and you should end up with open line. Okay, so forward and reverse bias. For diode testing, uh, and in terms of diode testing, you could check your diode trio, you could take, uh, check your rectifier bridge, see if those components are still serviceable. Uh, in terms of uh, other items inside the alternator that you could test, um, there's really not that much else inside there. If you're doing a bench test, a bench test is going to do pretty much the same thing as you did with your on-vehicle test. So when it comes to alternators, uh, one other, uh, just one other thing before we wrap this up that I want to uh, tell you about. Um, depending on the type of alternator that you're looking at, this is, this is a Delco alternator. If you look at the rear frame of the Delco alternator, there's usually a little D-shaped hole on the back of the alternator frame. All right, and that D-shaped hole is a test hole that lets you bypass the regulator. The whole idea here is you're going to take a, just a little screwdriver and you're going to stick it through that D-shaped hole and you're going to end up touching the brush connection and you're going to ground it through that D-shaped hole to the alternator frame. So basically what you're doing is you're bypassing the alternator to full field the alternator. You're bypassing the regulator to full field the alternator and see if it turns on. This can help you confirm if you have a faulty regulator or some other problem inside the alternator that's causing it not to charge. All right, so this right here, this is basically a review of uh, a generic, this is, this is a Delco alternator, but you know, the generic idea of how an alternator works, some simple testing that we can do uh, to figure out if it's working or not. Okay, on vehicle load testing. Probably the place that you're gonna start. Your charging voltage, uh, it may vary slightly um, depending on the alternator, depending on the system. But in general, you're alternately, the, the system voltage when you have a working alternator can range anywhere from normal battery voltage all the way up to 14 and a half, maybe sometimes even 15 and a half volts, uh, depending on the system. If your alternator charging voltage is way too high, it'll boil the battery and your water level in the battery is going to end up going down. So you don't want that. So on vehicle load, we can check normal charging voltage. And the other thing we can check on the vehicle is AC voltage. AC voltage, that's a way to check and see if our rectifier is doing what it's supposed to be doing. Other things we talked about here, exciting, So we may end up exciting a um, self-energizing alternator. And that would be something that you would probably want to try if you had a piece that had been sitting around for quite a while. Uh, that uh, machine, when you fired up that piece of equipment, it just won't charge. You take a look, the alternator's only got one um, wire coming off the back of it. It's that big fat battery wire. Okay, fair enough. This has got to be a self-energizing uh, alternator. Look for that stud coming out the back, hook that up to positive power momentarily. And if the alternator starts to charge, it's fixed. If it doesn't start to charge, then you'll have to do some further troubleshooting. When it comes to alternators and low output, don't forget about your low hanging fruit. If an alternator is not charging properly, some of the simple stuff might be the problem. Loose belts, worn pulleys, things like that.
So that wraps up this uh, brief uh, review of alternators and how alternators work and how we troubleshoot them.